Welcome to the Best Team Wins podcast with Adam Robinson. He's talking to today's industry leaders and entrepreneurs about the people side of their business. Welcome to the Best Team Wins podcast, where we feature entrepreneurs and business leaders whose exceptional approach to the people side of their business has led to incredible results. My name is Adam Robinson, and for the next 25 minutes, I'll be your host as we explore how to build your business through better hiring. Today on the program, so excited to welcome Jason Fiftel, the Chief Operating Officer at GH Smart. Uh, as many of you uh, may know, GH Smart, founded by uh, Jeff Smart uh, of Top Grading Lineage, is one of the preeminent uh, providers and thought leaders on leadership and leadership assessment and team building. Um, they're based in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been around since 1995. Currently, uh, staff uh, about 94 uh, internal employees and, and have been growing like crazy. Uh, Jason, we are so excited to welcome you to the show today. Thanks for being here. I'm excited to, to be here. Thanks for having me, Adam. So I read uh, recently you were named to the uh, 2018 Forbes list of a, America's best management consulting firms. Uh, congratulations. That's big news. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're proud to be on that list. And, and uh, I understand that, um, you know, prior to GH Smart, you were a principal with Bain & Company. So you've, you've seen a lot and done a lot. And so uh, I know our listeners are excited to learn from you today. Yeah, that's right. Actually, I started my career in finance and then did strategy work at Bain and now do leadership work at, uh, at GH Smart. So part of what's unique about GH Smart and my perspective is combining a sense where value is in business with the talent and leadership side of the equation. Excellent. Uh, so let's start there. Give, give us 30 seconds on GH Smart and what you do for your customers. Yeah, so if, uh, I guess you could put it simply that we're in the CEO success business. And the way we help CEOs be successful is by working with them on their highest stakes leadership and talent issues and decisions. And as you know, at the top of the list of those things are getting the hiring right. So one of the areas we find ourselves working often with CEOs, among other areas, are on those key positions, getting those hires right. And um, talk to us about your, your approach at a high level to doing that. Yeah, so our approach, which has been honed for over 20 years uh, and even longer with you know some of the work Jeff did prior to founding the company, uh, it follows what we call a structured interview process. And if I were to put it in simply three steps, it's if you want to get your hiring success up to 90% from what most managers are at 50%, you do three things. You know what you're looking for in a role, firstly, so you define success in a role. Two is you collect a bunch of data uh, around a person to understand their ability to do that. And then three, you put the two together. So you say, does all that data I've collected match what's needed in the role? And where they match, there's a fit. So you do this work for some of the largest private equity firms and, and growth investors in, in the world. Uh, and I'd love to drill into each of these three areas. And you, you, have, you, you have a an outcomes-based perspective on defining success. Uh, talk to us about that. What does it mean to define success in your model? Yeah, and you know, this is interestingly, you know, we work with companies on hiring all the time, and the questions always gravitate to the interview because people think that's the secret of hiring well. But what we found in our experience is just as important or, or more important is this notion of identifying success, particularly around the outcomes, what the person needs to achieve. Uh, is is critical. So an analogy for you would be, let's say you are the owner of an NFL team and you're looking to hire a wide receiver. And so if you just say, I need a wide receiver, uh, that's actually not nearly as helpful as saying, you know, I need a wide receiver who specializes in catching, you know, five to 10 yard passes to help with those kind of low to mid yardage gains each game and a wide receiver who's great at blocking because I already have a couple wide receivers that are great on down the field long passes. So you try to define those specific outcomes, even though they're both wide receivers, the specific outcome for the nature of wide receiver you need. And then when you go to analyze the videotapes, you can look to see, is that wide receiver doing those things uh, that we need them to do? That's great. That's, that's a, a perfect d distinction. And, uh, you know, I've heard Jeff talk about this and, and define this in his book, 
uh, Who, yeah. which is which is available, uh, you know, everywhere you can find books on the internet and out in the world, um, is is talking about defining specific outcomes at at certain points in time. Talk to us about that. What what does that look like in practice? Yeah. So, uh, and by the way, uh, we we call it a scorecard, and it does have both outcomes and competencies. We think of outcomes being what the person needs to accomplish and competencies being how they need to accomplish. So we can talk about the competencies piece in a second, but outcomes are so foundational because unless you're crisp on what the person needs to do, uh, you uh, you can't spot it in an interview if they've, they're able to do it. So what, what that would look like in a specific role, for example, is let's say we like to think of the perfectly written outcome is from what to what by when. So for instance, if you're looking for some sort of marketing leader, uh, one of those outcomes might be lead generation uh, from marketing campaigns. So you'd say, you know, grow the percentage of leads we have coming from marketing campaigns from, you know, 10 a month to 20 qualified leads per month by the end of the year. Uh, So you want to, if possible, get down to that specific. If you can't get specific metrics, what I like to say is at least make it observable. So describe it in a way that it's observable, because if it's observable, that means in an interview, you can actually observe it. So that that speaks to data collection. Yeah. Uh, You know, I read interesting research uh, late last year that that demonstrated that managers actually have a worse result in selection when they go into an interview and fire off random questions than <laughs> if they just picked a resume out of a pile. Yeah. The, the, we actually we, we actually make it worse by not knowing how to run interviews. So yeah. t- t- talk about collecting data and the importance of being prepared. Yeah, that's right. So when we, when we go into an interview, we follow what's called a structured interview process. Uh, an unstructured interview process doesn't increase your odds of success and in some ways can even lead <laughs> decrease your, your odds of success if you're following your gut because you might over-orient index on things like likability, et cetera. So we follow what's called a structured interview process. And the core of that is going through each person's job, what we call a career chapter, and asking a structured set of similar questions over and over for each job chapter that a candidate has had, and then the same types of questions in each jo- in each candidate we interview. And those questions are five questions. So in a given chapter, we'll ask, what was the mission for the role? You know, what were you hired to do? What metrics were you held accountable for? That's the first question. And what we're looking for there is, is what they're hired to do a match between with what we're looking them to hire them to do in this role. If so, it means that chapter is a really relevant chapter in the interview. The second question is, what were your biggest accomplishments? Third question is, what were your biggest learnings or mistakes? So that's what they need to accomplish. And then we get into some questions on how, which revolves around, you know, who is your team and who is your boss? That's the fourth set of questions. And the last question is, why did you leave? Understanding those transitions is critical to understanding someone's trajectory of success. So that that set of structured questions we find is critical because then allows you to be the same from one candidate to the next and extract uh, a systematically information from, from candidates. I'll go back to that wide receiver analogy. So what most managers would do is they might have the wide receiver come into their office and have them talk about you know, why they're a great wide receiver. A structured interview would actually mean, let's go to the videotape and go back to, hey, talk me through your last game. Uh, tell me about your biggest accomplishments. Oh, well, I caught 18 passes that were between five and 10 yards long. And by the way, I, I blocked the uh, the key person that led to our other wide receiver scoring uh, on the winning touchdown play. So you're actually going back into the career of those chapters, asking those structured questions to surface the data relevant to the scorecard. One of the I mean, as we sit here today, we're, we're at, you know, near or at historic uh, lows in the unemployment rate. Yeah. This week, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported the widest gap between availability of open jobs and the number yeah. of people looking for work. And so, you know, w- where many of our listeners are in their businesses having to import talent from other industries. And one of the biggest concerns I get is how do I assess someone's ability to generate an outcome if the outcomes they've generated came in a different industry and I've got to import them into this? you know, d- different area? How can I reconcile competency with, you know, vocational skill or industry knowledge? 
Yeah. And, uh, th- you know, that's harder than if they've been in the industry, right? So you're, uh, you know, innately that interview is going to be a little bit more difficult. You know, here's an interesting data point is actually, if you were to look at things that predict job success, experience isn't up on the list at all of one of the most predictive things, things like cognitive ability, uh, you know, internal or external, what we call locus of control, those sorts of things, um, which I won't go into detail here. There are a few factors that are a little more predictive, but experience isn't that predictive. So if you're a hiring manager that's looking for candidates with 15 plus years and ruling out ones that have less than 15 plus years of experience, stop doing that because you're missing great candidates. The things you then want to look for. So let's say you're looking for people outside of your industry, what you need to do is you need to dig the next level below the outcome and say, what are the critical skills and competencies that if someone were to achieve that that outcome would lend me to believe that they actually have the ability to, to do it? Uh, and so as an example of that, uh, let's say you are looking to hire somebody into your business and they're going to be in an operational, an operational role, you know, overseeing projects, right? Uh, and you're hiring somebody from a different industry, right? So if they're overseeing projects, you're going to look for skills around project management. And so as you dig into their history at their prior company, you want to understand, are there any projects they led within those? You know, were they on time? How did they go about planning out those projects, et cetera? So you're looking for, you end up having to dig underneath just outcomes and looking for those competencies that drive the ultimate result. So, so we've defined success with outcomes. Yes. Uh, from what to, to where and, you know, by when. Yep. We, we've collected this data. Talk about the third leg of the stool here and, and putting them together to make a choice. Yeah, putting them together. Sure. So uh, once you have the scorecard and once you have this data, and, and by the way, each chapter, that, that flow of mission along with uh, what they accomplished, both mistakes and accomplishments, and then how they accomplished it, particularly talking about how they worked with others to achieve it, maps perfectly to our scorecard, which has uh, it actually has a mission at the top, but then has these outcomes and competencies. So for each chapter, what you end up with is basically, let's say they've had three jobs, you end up with three sets of data that you then overlay with the scorecard, starting with the mission to say, is this chapter that relevant? Within that chapter, let me look at the scorecard items and say, does the data in the interview match up with that scorecard? So you'll be comparing... The, basically, the scorecard your answer key against the data you collected and grading them on it. And for each outcome, they'll get a, a grade, you know, A, B, C, or if you want to use one to five scale, they'll get a grade. And after going through that structured evaluation process against the scorecard, you have a good sense overall of the person's probability of success in the role. So we've talked about, you know, how to make the, the, the choice, um, you know, bringing someone into a senior leadership team for a, a fast growing business is, is a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and the integration I have found is, is as or more important than the selection. <laughs> what are, you know, based on your broad perspective, I mean, you see, you've seen this, you know, o- over hundreds of, of hires made this methodology. What, what can you advise our audience on based on your experience to maximize the acceptance rate into the organization when you're bringing a senior leader in? Yeah. So are you talking about onboarding or as you're picking the person trying to understand their cultural and DNA fit? P- uh, Post hiring decision, we're now onboarding them into the organization. Yeah. How do we make sure the body doesn't reject the organ? Yeah, that's right. So um, so uh, the point number one is you actually uh, you actually focus on it. Most companies, interestingly, when they hire and in, hire in people kind of just let them run and actually don't treat it like a priority. It's something you need to manage and spend time on. So there's a cultural element here of how you uh, how you prioritize and invest your time and energy. Uh, and you need to actually make it a priority to help make these these people successful. Uh, you know, a few of the best practices um, that we talk about when new leaders are being onboarded into an organization, uh, there's a conversation that needs to happen in the first week of, of a leader being on board where you systematically walk, if you're the person's hiring manager, you systematically walk them through a series of, and we, we divide up into three types of things. Their priorities, if they're a leader of teams, their team, that's the second thing, their who, and then the lastly, relationships. Uh, and what you want to lay out for that person right when they're starting is a roadmap against each, right? So you talk to them about their priorities. Here's my boss. Here's what I expect you to accomplish. If you have a scorecard written, you can actually use that scorecard for that purposes, so there's very clear alignment around those priorities and a conversation with the new hire of where they're more or less confident in their ability to achieve those 
those priorities or were you as a boss? So you come away from that conversation with clarity on what you want the person, what you're communicating to your new hire they need to accomplish. Second, around the team, you have a, a, a conversation around that person's direct reports to transmit what you know about the team, what you don't know, talk about any moves or changes that may need to be made to help strengthen strengthen the team and develop them. And then on relationships, you're talking about who they need to meet uh, within the organization, who are their key counterparts, uh, and what's their plan to meet them. I would also say on priorities, there's a piece about knowledge too. So there's, there may be some things they need to learn about the, the company and industry. Uh, so we call it like a kickoff, a kickoff conversation that should happen. And that's really effective because out of that, you basically come up with a plan of how the person should spend their first 30, 60 days uh, in onboarding. And then you need to have a follow-up, uh, a structured follow-up, uh, I would say within the first 90 days, ideally after 60 days to see how the person's doing performance-wise and against that plan. You know, Adam, I know I've heard you mention this before. You know, somebody who's not panning out, uh, those first 30 to 60 and 90 days are critical because uh, you actually could lose a good person that just gets off to a bad uh, a bad start. Um, or you may find yourself with an underperformer that you don't want to wait a year or two years to have to address that you need to address rather quickly. So staying on top of it, uh, I guess I go back to my first point, you got to stay on top of it, focus it. And I would suggest those two touch points, one off the bat in the first week, and then one around 60 days to formally kick them off and assess how they're doing. And what does that conversation look like if it's if that's all happening and it's just not landing? If some if something is just isn't catching, what is that conversation between leader leader and newly hired leader um, sound like? Ideally? Yeah, so you've got the person that's underperforming. I think is what you're what you're saying. Correct. Now, uh, presuming you have a scorecard or you've actually d- documented and written the person's priorities for the role. The best way to have the conversation is it's not about you and the other person. It's about what you're expected, what's being expected out of that person in the role. So it depersonalizes it. So if you have a set of performance objectives or scorecard, whatever language you want to use, you can go back to that conversation you had in the first week and say, all right, here was that priorities part of the conversation. We talked about this being what needed to be accomplished. You know, we're 60 days in. On these two dimensions, we're not seeing any progress. You know, what do you think the reason for that is? Um, and you and you can talk through it, and now it becomes a problem solving conversation around the objectives, and also very much an accountability conversation where you're clearly communicating these things aren't happening, and then you build a specific plan to say, all right, if in the next thirty to sixty days they're not they're not moving, then you've really got an issue. So the two pieces of advice I would I would say is document the priorities so that you can actually base the conversation around something you jointly committed to at the outset. And secondly, have the courage as a leader to act on it quickly. You know, interestingly, I talked before about cognitive ability and a couple, you know, a couple of these predictors that upon hiring are slightly more indicative of people that are, are likely to be successful in any role at any level in the company. When you look at executive leaders, we've done multiple studies. We've assessed over 18,000 leaders. There's one variable that always pops across any study where we're looking, whether we're looking at CEOs, general, you know, managers, uh, different functions, different industries. And it's this concept of moving fast on talent that when a leader moves fast on talent, they're like six times more likely to be successful uh, than leaders who don't move fast on talent. So if in your gut or in data, you know, somebody's underperforming, you have to have that conversation and do it in the spirit of jointly achieving their objectives and supporting them doing that. To, to wax philosophical yeah. for a second, I'm, I'm, I'm curious with your experience, you know, working uh, for, for Bain and your experience uh, uh, advising clients at GH Smart, yeah. what, what, I certainly have a perspective on this, but, you know, on one side, you've got business models and, and market opportunity. Mm-hmm. And in, in, some, in some ways, you can, you can never overcome a flawed business model or a, or a market that's too small. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, you've got quality of talent and leadership based on your experience what what's the more important thing for early growth stage CEOs to be thinking about you know where where they prioritize their focus and attention on the business is it get the team right or get the model right 
Um, what, what do you find is the more important factor early? Uh, companies yeah, there? so we've looked at companies in all stages of their growth trajectory. And, uh, and so we've looked at the, this isn't just my experience. This is actually data. Um, uh, we know it's leaders who put who first are the ones that are more likely to be successful in uh, in growing their business. So, uh, yes, you can be a great product guy, but ultimately, if you have the right team around you, you, you can take a great product and with a great team, you know, achieve the world. You can take an okay product and with a great team, achieve a whole lot. Uh, you can't take a great product and a bad team and achieve anything. So you got to get the who right. You put the who first, then the what. That's when the magic happens. One of the uh, uh, approaches in, in, the, in the who methodology yeah. um, is, is this notion of understanding, speaking to moving fast on talent, understanding uh, when you're assessing someone's ability to lead and make quick decisions on team, you know, asking the question, what was the team like when you inherited it? And what did it look like when you left mm, it? Yeah. What are we, what are we, what are we trying to find here? What, what is the data point we want to uncover? Yeah. There? So yeah, how that looks is you're, you're, you're literally asking when you get to that part of this structured interview, you're asking what was the team you inherited and what changes did you make to it? And what you want to see is between when somebody comes in the role and by the time they leave the role, that the team has gotten better. So you may ask, follow that up with a question of, all right, so you had five direct reports. How would you rate where they were at the start, you know, between A, B, and C, you know, players for their role? Uh, and then, you, you know, by the end of it, you say, well, how would you rate the team? And what you want to see is a leader who is willing to, uh, to make pro- or made tangible progress in building out, developing their team so they strengthened it by the time they left left that role. That could be through hiring in and augmenting the team, could be through restructuring the team, could be just taking a couple people, coaching, developing them up. Oftentimes it's a bad apple that they have to let go or move to another uh, role that's better suited to them. So you really want to see a leader who's actively uh, actively working working those levers. You know, when uh, Whenever we're interviewing leaders and we find a leader that we say is what we call an enlightened leader, which means uh, the who bulb has gone off, like they get the importance of who and they address it with urgency. Uh, like for us, almost inevitably, they're going to end up getting A rated because if they get great teams, they're going to have great results. So that one factor alone, I cannot underemphasize how important it is. One other data point, if I can go just a second longer than this point, uh, the, we, when we looked at leaders and we looked at the top like 1% of performance leaders in our, in our giant database, the ones that literally got the, the top 1% of results, and they're doing great on moving fast, we actually could go into the data and see how much faster they're moving. Um, and the, the data said they're moving six times faster. So picture that if it takes you 12 months to act on a talent gap in your team, somebody's just struggling, they've done it in two months. Uh, they're literally moving that, that much faster on talent. Just like with an operational issue or if you're running a plant, uh, and a customer delivery is late, you wouldn't sit on it. You're all over it. Same thing on your team. If you know somebody isn't knocking their scorecard out of the park, you help them with it, right? And uh, and you jump all over it, just like it's a, a customer issue or a product issue or some other operational issue. Is the rate limiting factor on, on moving fast just the fact that most people are just too nice or afraid of a difficult conversation? Yeah, that's uh, that's a big that's a big part of it as humans. You know, the other piece. So uh, interestingly, if uh, if you look at different competencies in terms of how coachable certain and improvable certain things are. So if you take somebody's intellectual ability, uh, they're smart, so to speak, that's very tough to change or some deep motivational uh, uh, factor about them that, that you can't change, but there are certain skills and competencies that are changeable. And interestingly, this one around hiring and moving fast on talent, particularly the hiring piece, but even the moving fast on talent, uh, somebody can be trained and, and eventually develop the courage to get better at it. Because what happens is even these people that are wired to be too nice, the first time they kind of actually do it and move fast, they see the results and they're like, wow, uh, and so these hiring skills we're talking about, and even the little bit of the motivational skill around the willingness to do it, once you've done it, you see the light and, uh, and you never go back. Pretty, um, pretty clear. I mean, it, it, it sounds to me like the, you know, based on your data and, ex- and the experience that you have, uh, the number one skill for leaders of people is the ability to spot 
uh, select and, and, and manage talent. That's right. From your that's right. That's, that's pretty and by the way, use this not just in hiring, use it for promotion decisions, right? So same thing there. Be clear on, you know, the, the criteria that you're looking for, for that person to be promoted and follow this, you know, same sort of structured process so you can make great, great decisions on putting people in the right roles for them, no matter whether it's a new person coming in or an existing person moving around. As, as we uh, bring this to a close here, I'm curious, looking internally, what's on deck uh, in terms of new research or approach uh, for, for GH Smart? What are you advising customers to be on the lookout for um, as, you know, as we continue the tightest labor market that most of us have ever seen? <laughs> um, well, I'll offer, uh, so uh, let me think through that question on the labor market specifically, but there's, uh, we did just publish a book this past year called The CEO Next Door. Uh, that, that we did research on the CEOs in our database, and there's a couple thousand of just CEOs. Uh, and so if any of your readers here are not a CEO today, but are interested in becoming one, or maybe interested in leading a division, kind of being in that role of, of a P&L owner, uh, I would suggest getting the book because it talks not just about the behaviors that make successful CEOs successful. It actually talks about how you can navigate your career to get into that role. Uh, so that's an interesting thing for any of your listeners who have aspirations and growing and developing uh, as uh, as leaders. I would say in terms of the, the talent market and how tight it is, uh, the toughest decision the listeners here are probably going to be faced with is uh, you're going to want to compromise, right? Uh, you've been struggling to fill that role. And now somebody's in front of you and in your gut, you kind of know they're a B player versus that A player or rock star you've been looking for, but you got to just fill the role. Boy, nine out of ten times, if not more, that doesn't that doesn't pan out. So we always say, don't compromise um, uh, on on talent because the moment you do that, you start to build a culture of B players, and you know B players want to work with B players, A players want to work to A players. So it hurts your ability to hire A players in the future. So if there's one piece of advice I get having this tough market is just as best as you can, suck it up, don't compromise. Uh, look for that great talent, uh, even if it takes you a little longer, it'll it'll pay dividends down the line. If listeners want to learn more about GH Smart or about the CEO next door, what's the best way for them to do yeah, that? Yeah, they can go to, well, our books are on Amazon. So who the A method for hiring describes the structured interview process I talked about and the CEO next door are out there if they want to buy it. They could also go to our website, ghsmart.com to learn more about who we are as a firm. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the final word you've been learning from Jason Fiftel, Chief Operating Officer at GH Smart. Jason, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Adam. That's a wrap for this week's episode of the Best Team Wins Podcast, where we're featuring entrepreneurs and business leaders whose exceptional approach to the people side of their business has led to incredible results. My name is Adam Robinson, author of the book, The Best Team Wins, which you can find online at www.thebestteamwins.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you here next week. Thanks for listening to the Best Team Wins podcast with Adam Robinson. You can find out more information about Adam and his book, The Best Team Wins, Building Your Business Through Predictive Hiring at thebestteamwins.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week.